Welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, the electronics reporter. We hear about technological advances every day. New highly integrated microcontrollers, wide band gap technologies and MEM sensors. But if I were to mention magnets, would any recent scientific discoveries spring to mind? Probably not. Despite this, magnets are an important part of many electronic applications and even of our everyday lives, such as in packaging or even to hold a door closed. So in which applications do magnets and electronics most often converge? How do you specify a magnet? And how would you go about proving that a magnet meets your technical requirements? To find out more, my experts for this episode are Ender Nickel from Analog Devices and Kern Fafika from MagCam. So welcome to the show, Ender. Bring you in there. Hi there. Hi, uh, hi Stuart. Good afternoon. Good to see you. So um, tell us just briefly then about yourself and your role at Analog Devices. Yes, I'm the uh, I'm the marketing manager for magnetic sensors at Analog Devices uh, here in Limerick, Ireland. Uh, been with Analog Devices about 17 years now. So uh, been working in the sensor domain with you know throughout my career for about uh, 25 30 years now so uh, yeah it's been it's been my life sensors super so good or exciting, bad. exciting <laughs> to have you on the, yeah. the show and we look forward to find out a little bit more about uh, about what you can tell us about uh, sensors that um, detect magnetic fields so hang in there and we'll speak to you shortly sure okay and then we've got Cohen as well hi Cohen welcome to the show hi Stuart thank you very much for having me so give us a brief introduction uh, about yourself and what it is that you do at MagCam. Well, I'm uh, the founder and CEO of MagCam. I founded MagCam 13 years ago, 2009, after my PhD studies and, uh, and uh, R&D on a magnetic field camera device that I developed. And then I built a company out of it to uh, do quality inspection of permanent magnets and permanent magnet assemblies, electric rotors, and all, everything to do with permanent magnets. Fantastic. Well, you sound like the right person to have on the show to tell us about how to define those uh, specifications around magnets and how to check them. So we look forward to chatting to you later on in the show. Great, thanks. So um, there we go. That's the right one. So Flowcode is um, an exciting development environment that enables users to quickly construct complex systems from electric vehicle chargers to alarm systems on ships, and it uses uh, and offers a graphical programming and drag and drop components. Due to its fast array of easy to use functions, huge component libraries, and ability to simulate your design with its integrated panels, flow code is used globally across industrial, education, and maker markets, and is sponsoring today's show. To try it for yourself, download it for free today from flowcode.co.uk slash download. That's flowcode.co.uk slash download. Now, my understanding of magnets is, let's say, pretty limited. Although I did once visit a factory that made them. So like me, you've probably got as many questions for my guests as I have. Regardless of where you're watching, join in the conversation by posting your comments and questions during the show. Simply use the chat function on YouTube and LinkedIn or you can tweet us on Twitter if it still exists using hashtag electorei. And we'll do our best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. So let's pull in uh, Ender again. Welcome to the show, Ender. Now, where I actually wanted to start was at the very, very beginning, like we do on this show. Now, when we think of sort of semiconductor magnetic position sensors, I think one of the first technologies that comes to mind or that an engineer would say is a hall sensor. But if I search around on the internet for, for sort of magnetic sensors, uh, anisotropic magnetoresistive or AMR technology seems to sort of be the, the, the technology that is of better quality or offers better, um, a, a better result than a, a hall sensor. So what are these AMR sensors and, and how are they different to hall sensors? Yeah, so yeah, they're different to hall. Uh, it is fundamental different uh, sensor measures uh, detects the direction of a change in magnetic field, 
whereas a Hall sensor detects the change in the intensity of the magnetic field. So uh, that's the fundamental difference, you know, at a, from a functional point of view. So what that means in an application then is that they're less sensitive to, let's say, air gap variation when you have a sensor position in front of the magnet if there's some uh, axial movement. Uh, the, the change in direction of magnet is, is only affecting uh, the rotation. You can vary the air gap, so it makes it easier to integrate into the solution. There's also no upper magnetic field limit with, uh, with AMR sensors, so that means you can apply a very strong magnetic field, and that makes it very robust in a harsh environment where you would have maybe stray magnetic fields. Uh, yeah, so there. I suppose that's the main thing. Also, with our our EMR sensors, we have extremely high high bandwidth amplifiers, and uh, we can run them at up to speeds of fifty thousand RPM. So, yeah, that's that's some of the some of the basics, at least. Yeah. Now, also sort of searching around and researching prior to the show, there's an, another type of magnetic field sensor which I found, which is called a giant magneto resistance um, sensor yeah. or GMR. How is that then different from Hall sensors and AMR technology? Yeah, it's, it belongs to the magnetoresistor family. So in the, you have AMR, GMR, and TMR. So the GMR, the giant, as you mentioned there, giant magnetoresistor, that is similar to AMR in that it's sensitive again to changes in the magnetic field direction. However, it's a more complex structure and it's it's built of multiple layers. You have pinned layers and free layers. Um, and having the pinned layer allows you the ability to have a reference point. When you, so you can do full 360 degree measurement with a, with a GMR sensor. But it has some limitations in terms of the magnetic um, upper magnetic field that, um, that that AMR offers. It doesn't have that same capability. But I think it was uh, uh, largely developed to overcome the 180 degree limitation of AMR. Right. Now, looking at the sort of portfolio of, of AMR sensors that uh, analog devices has, um, it's, I mean, mm. un unlike a whole sensor, which seems to be quite straightforward, um, these AMR sensors, they're, they're highly integrated and they've got a complete set of signal conditioning built alongside them. What sort of applications Correct. are your customers using these for? Yeah, we typically integrate, as you say, uh, the amplifier circuit with our EMR sensors, um, high-speed amplifiers. Um, so um, we would have um, uh, differential and uh, single-ended analog out parts available and also uh, dual uh, parts with redundancy for safety critical applications. So the general uh, applications that they get designed into are encoders, basically. So they're measuring sh uh, shaft position for motor commutation is, is the typical application that can be across multiple industrial applications or automotive applications. Uh, some of the automotive applications we would be in production with, they would, would include steering, uh, mo uh, starter generator motors um, as, as two examples. Um, and in industrial space, obviously, there's the motors going into industrial automation uh, the type type applications. <clears throat> so um, the, another sort of interesting point that came out of uh, looking at all those sensors is um, obviously the, the applications you're talking about is uh, rotors. Mm -hmm. You know, we all know a rotor makes a full rotation at 360 degrees. But the, the yes. sensors, when I look at the data sheets, sheet, it says there's an angular angular range of 180 degrees. What, what does that actually then mean in practice? And how do you then handle that sort of limitations, it seems to me, reading the data sheet, for something like a steering wheel or a rotor that obviously rotates fully mm. many, many times? Yeah, I mentioned there motor commutation. So uh, when you have an, an even um, number of pole pairs in a motor, you don't need uh, 360. You can you can operate with a 180 degree uh, sensor. So that's the combination of the accuracy and the robustness. Um, you know, motor uh, motor companies are you know they're designing their motors with with even number of poles to design in AMR, and, and it works out quite well. Um, for steering, yeah, you're correct. I mean, you can't live with a you know, a steering wheel typically moves about plus or minus three turns, which is over plus or minus a thousand degrees. So the only way you can overcome that today is by <clears throat> putting in um, a gearing, a gear reduction mechanism and uh, applying multiple single turn sensors and doing an onus uh, principle to work out your, your steering angle. So yeah, that's that's a challenge. And, uh, you know, they're mostly mechanical type and comp manic mechanical combined with, with single turn sensors is the usual uh, way you can sort that. You can also continuously power the system at all times, obviously, and uh, to retain information and memory. But that, that's, a, that's not desirable as well. 
Yeah, exactly. This, this, this is a big challenge, isn't it? Because obviously once the, the sensor's turned off, then you're not able to detect any, any changes in the magnetic field anymore. But that brings me yes. on to one of the reasons why I was sort of excited to get you on as a, a guest for, for this edition of Electro Engineering Insights was um, I met you at Sensor and Test this year back in, uh, in Nuremberg. And right. um, you were showing a multi-turn sensor. Now, this, this mm -hmm. sensor integrates both AMR and GMR sensing technology. And it's capable of supporting 46 turns, which is 16, over 16,000 degrees of, of movement. Can you tell us, um, share a little yes, bit more about, yeah. about that sensor and, and uh, what you were showing at uh, Sensor and Test? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So this 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 new new product, we're very excited uh, about it coming to the market soon. It's it's the the world's first uh, multi turn single chip IC. It combines, as you said, a GMR uh, spiral uh, multi turn uh, chip, uh, an AMR angle sensor, a signal conditioning ASIC uh, to provide the full uh, absolute measurement range of zero to to forty six turns or zero to sixteen and a half thousand degrees of 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 range. So it's it's a game changer and. Uh, you know, we're getting great traction in the market for it, so we're really excited about this product and and this technology in general. It's um, it's really revolutionising the way um, designers will design actuators uh, going forward. So tell us a little bit more about the the difference between the role of the AMR um, sensor and the role of the GMR sensor in in this um, in this device. Yeah. So the the uh, the GMR. Um, if you want, maybe you could pull up the slide there, and I can maybe explain it, Stuart, if, if you like the um, the slide number um, number two to start with. Or yeah, um, so so the, this is this this is a, explains a little bit on the GMR device here, how it how it operates. So it's based on an effect known as shape anisotropy. Um, sort of the lower section in the middle of the slide there shows the basic structure uh, form. You have what they call a domain wall generator. And you have a magnetic, a very narrow magnetic nanowire exiting that domain wall generator. And if you rotate a magnet in front of this structure, uh, the uh, the magnetic, the, the arrows in, in, within the structure, you will see the field line uh, represent the direction of the magnet rotating. So as you can see there, into the main wall generator, the, the, the magnetic field is rotating with the magnet. But if you look at the very na narrow uh, nanowires, you'll see that they're only magnetized in one or two, in, in two directions. Um, so in order to, to uh, uh, how it works is the main walls propagate from, from the, the domain wall generator into the spiral, uh, but they will, not, uh, uh, they, they will not reverse until you go beyond about 100 and, uh, yeah, well beyond 180 degrees, as you can see there, it flips, and the the uh, the rotation the, the rotation of direction, uh, the magnetization flips flips backwards. So what we do is we build that structure on a on a GMR process, and uh, so effectively then, when you change the direction of the magnetic field, as I explained earlier, with magnetoresistive resistive technology, you change the resistance value. So we we then create a spiral is shown to the right hand side of the bottom of the slide there that's the two times 23 turns um that's the basic spiral structure of the uh, uh the magnetic sensor in our in our new product and and the magnet basically as it rotates the, the domain walls propagate through the different legs of the spiral so we tap into the corners of the spiral um, and we we read back the um on power up then after the magnet has rotated we, we can read back the new uh turn information uh, and uh, yeah, and if you move on then to the next slide, Stuart, I'll explain that in a bit more detail. How how that uh, so that GMR? If you look at the block diagram there, you'll see the turn count sensor. That's the GMR spiral I'm referring to. On that same GMR die, we have a quadrant sensor, and uh, we also then below that you can see the AMR angle sensor. So we muck, we take all these inputs. We take the, uh, the the turn count spiral information. We take the quadrant information, combine that with the angle uh, AMR angle sensor. We mux that through here, and we have a control logic uh, and diagnostics chip there, or uh, block there, as you can see within the chip. Uh, and from that, we work out then, we have on-chip calibration, uh, offset correction, and so on. So we provide then a digital out, zero to 16 and a half thousand degree output. Uh, that's the fundamentals of the of the chip. Yes. Uh... Really impressive um, how that that uh, how that works. Uh, just looking at the slides there to try and dig out some of the uh, the details of of how the yeah the the, the magnetic field flips and on the GMR aspect of it. So um, the, mm -hmm. this is this is, just wanted to clarify as well that I understood correctly. So 
Um, this, the GMR part of the sensor, that doesn't need to be continuously powered in order for the magnetic field changes to be detected. Is that right? That's correct, yes. So basically, the energy is coming from the magnet. It's moving the domains around the spiral as the magnet rotates, and it fills the spiral. So even without any electrical power, that phenomena uh, exists, and that, that's how uh, we can retain the information. So it's like a magnetic right electrical read um, uh, uh, sort of principle. So a, the, as long as the magnet, and if it will also retain retain the information, it'll retain the position indefinitely as long as the magnetic field is present in front of the sensor. And if it's if it rotates without power, you you can track that motion as well. So it's, it's, it's re, it truly is a, 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 a an absolute through power on multi term position sensor. And also just to clarify as well, because it, it just seems a little bit too difficult to believe. <laughs> <laughs> if, if my if my magnet is rotating clockwise, say three turns, while the sensor mm -hmm. is not powered, and then yep. um, and then it turns back two yes. um, rotations, uh, even that that forwards backwards movement is mm -hmm. is detected by the GMR sensor. It, it is indeed. So as I, as I show, as I mentioned, when you rotate the magnet in front of the spiral, you propagate domain walls through the spiral change in the resistance values. But if you rotate the stop and rotate the magnet in the opposite direction, you start to empty the spiral of the main walls. You can it's the reverse process. So it it, it counts in both both directions. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So you need a certain magnetic energy for that to happen. So there's a magnetic window that the the sensor has to operate within. Um, to, to, to ensure that the, that that functionality uh, yeah. happens, you know, and and during this time, from a mechanical perspective, that that magnet doesn't mm -hmm. need to be moving closer and, and and moving further away as I'm rotating it. It can just stay in the same plane um, distance from the sensor all the time. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, we have to take into account some 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 axial play in in the shaft of the the uh, the actuator. So you know, we 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 design uh, the system. We can help support uh, customers design a, a magnet solution um, for for the system, which takes into account their mechanical tolerances, for example, in in their system. But yeah, as long as the magnet is positioned within, let's say, two millimeters plus or minus half a millimeter or, or whatever. It's an example. I'm not saying that's the that's the ideal number, but you know that that is a typical kind of a. a, a, a... Now, when it comes to electronics and, and semiconductors, I think most engineers are quite uh, comfortable pulling out some data sheets and, and mm. searching through uh, all the specifications there, looking at um, uh, microamps and milliwatts and uh, voltages and, and currents and so on and so forth. But um, this sort of uh, I, I've never had to specify a magnet before um, as part of a, mm -hmm. a system that I'm building. So, sure. how does how do how do engineers go about specifying the magnets to work with any of these sort of these magnetic sensors that you use? And um, I mean, are we talking about strength? Are there certain shapes are necessary? Materials that you know? What what, mm -hmm. what do you? How do you get your customers to to the right magnet? Yeah, so I suppose this new sensor is 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 changing the the landscape a little bit when it comes to magnet design. The the GMR spiral um, uh, functionality, the shape anisotropy effect that I've shown you, operate works within a certain magnetic window. So there, are, you know, we there you have to design your magnet to to ensure that there's a minimum of um, let's say 16 millitesla and a maximum of 31 millitesla operating window. Um, and that's 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 the, that's the basic of you know if we retain that everything will work perfectly so if you go below the 16 millitesla you can you 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 don't have enough potentially don't have enough energy to to propagate the domains through the spiral and if you go too high what happens then is you actually uh, saturate the sensor you fill uh, prematurely the, the spiral with domains so uh, and that's in fact what we do to reset the part to we apply a strong it doesn't do any it doesn't have any uh, long term effect on the part we we to, to, to reset it, you fill, you apply a stronger magnetic field to, to reset and refill it. Yeah, that, that creates a little bit more of a challenge for the magnet design. So you need to ensure that the, um, the, that the part of the system is, uh, is, is working within that magnetic window through over life, over temperature, over changes in mechanical tolerances of the system and so on. So, but, you know, we have, um, we, we, we have um, in-house capabilities to support customers. Uh, and we're, uh, you know, we've also got a, a reference design to get customers started. Now it's not our intention to supply magnets to the, to the, to the market, but we, we, we understand 
to help customers design, designing the part we do support initial magnet design support <clears throat> and provide and provide some samples starting off to give them a, a hand with the design in process you know if, if most engineers in our field were to sort of pick up a resistor or um, a capacitor um, we'd have a, a relatively good feeling for what the differences between mm -hmm. say 20 ohms and, and 20 kilo ohms um, what does a sort of a, yeah, a 20 to 30 millitesla magnet feel in terms of strength how, how could i imagine it strength from a strength perspective if i was holding it uh, <laughs> oh you'd notice it all right yeah i mean they'll it'll it'll, it'll be like a a very strong uh fridge fridge magnet if you like as, as, a, as okay. a comparison um yeah no it, it yeah definitely it's it's a, it's, it's a strong magnet and um, because we want to retain a sort of a window over a lifetime you do need to you know go with a um a rare earth typically a rare earth material some medium cobalt or so on um type material to 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 ensure that stability of over a lifetime um and uh yeah so look there's the, 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 the there are you know it's it is it is a little bit more of a challenge than than with a standard uh, 360 degree or 180 degree angle sensor but it's 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 something that we've addressed and we we can support and uh support our customers with um, as needed and that particular strength of of magnet is is that also something that you'd be specifying for the the, the amr sensors that you uh have in your portfolio or, or do they require yeah. a, 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 strong, a less strong magnet no, it's funny. I mean, the AMR, I think um, they operate in saturation, so you can apply a strong magnetic field as you like. And in fact, we recommend a very high field typically in, in general applications because it is it makes the, the system very robust. If you have, let's say, a 150 millitesla magnet, uh, uh, which is extremely strong, and you have some stray fields of a couple of millitesla in the environment, they're, they're swamped out by the, the strength of the magnet that we're, that's, that's operating the sensor. So uh, maybe that brings up another point. So when, when you're designing a magnet for the multi turn chip, you do need to take that into account, and um, some shielding is necessary in the environment if it's very harsh. And uh, we, have, we have some designs for, for, for the shielding uh, to, to support customers as well. Um, and it doesn't seem to be a showstopper. Customers are, are willing to take that on board. I think the overall the benefits that the magnetic sensor brings, the multi turns brings, weighs out the the having to to take extra precaution when it comes to shielding stray fields in the environment. Yeah, super. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction to the uh, the sensing technology. I, I, I was I was blown away by the demonstration uh, that I saw in sensor and test because I, I I just um, yeah. I don't know it's, it just seems like magic. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, when we showed the demo first, when we uh, the customers usually say uh, that's impossible, and they take they take the demo, they look for the battery underneath. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, it's quite it's quite funny. Um, yeah, and also, I, and we have some. If you if if customers want to visit uh, analog.com forward slash magnetics, we've got some uh, technical article there, and we've got some videos uh, from the shows. Uh, you, yeah. you you know, um, again showing showing the the, the demonstrator. Um, uh, and of course, you can contact myself at, at analog into dot nickel at analog devices as well if if you want to follow up directly with me afterwards. So, uh, yeah, thank you. No, it's it's really excited with about this technology, and yeah, it's 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 it's, it's really you know it's, it, it is really a game changer. Good. So thanks ever so much for that. We'll leave it there for the time being because we've no got problem. some um, uh, like a roundtable discussion at the end where we can uh, talk about a bit more about magnet magnets, magnetism and magnetic sensors. So stay there with us and we'll be back with you yeah. uh, towards the end of the show. Sure. Thanks, Stuart. OK, now it's um, giveaway time. In our last show, we examined the Rust programming language and gave away five ESP32 Pico Kit version 4 boards. Congratulations to Norbert, Martin, Marcin, Roland, and Michael. We'll be in touch to get your mail addresses shortly. Now, to extend our thanks to you as a loyal Engineering Insights viewer, for this episode, I have two science kits containing no less than 37 experiments for Arduino. Unfortunately, I don't know much more than that, but to me, it sounds like a great little package, which will greatly expand your collection of boards for developing uh, new and exciting projects. So for your chance to win, simply visit the link shown below and enter the keyword Tesla, that's the keyword Tesla, with your entry. And we wish you all the luck with that. 
So now we move on to my other second guest, Kern from MagCam. Hi, good to have you back. Hi, Stuart. Thanks for having me. It's great to be on the show. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Um, now, I, I actually have um, been following MagCam for a long time. I don't think we've personally met, uh, but I was, again, um, blown away by the technology. I, I think it was um, Embedded World eight, nine, ten years ago. Um, when I saw, I think we've been center and that's the Nuremberg that you mentioned because we've been on that show also since uh, yeah, uh, exactly. all, all these years. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, which, so it's great to have you on because um, I'd really like to explore and share, um, explore your understanding of magnetics. I think that's really important. Also, share a little bit more about MagCam as a as a sensing technology and testing tool because uh, it's very very clever. So um, before we get too much into that. Um, what I wanted to start with was is, uh, just say to you, as I, as I did at the beginning, we, we see lots of advancements in silicon and in computing and AI software and all these things, and they're, they're regularly on the news, even in, in the, you know, the, the general press as well. But we don't really uh, hear very much news about sort of magnetism and magnets. It seems almost like sort of 19th century scientists were busy with that and, and we're almost finished. <laughs> is that really the case or is there still techno sort of advancements going on? Absolutely, there are many advancements, but because the magnets are not so much on the foreground, but they are playing very important roles uh, on, in, in the background, behind the hoods, under the hoods of all of these systems like electric motors, um, consumer electronics, uh, your phone, uh, smart watches, um, uh, e even even uh, classic watches use uh, tiny permanent magnets. Um, in, in windmills, uh, all the renewable energy, uh, their magnets play a, a very important role be it in, in the windmill generators or in the electric vehicle, electric motors uh, and generators. Uh, also all the position sensing systems that you've been talking about uh, with ENDA, which by the way is a, is a, a super uh, exciting product that he has. So, um, and uh, yeah, so, um, there's a lot of challenges going on uh, for the magnets because uh, the applications get more and more demanding. Uh, people want to make, for example, sensor systems, like Anne also mentioned, that are ever more uh, accurate. Uh, and for that, the magnets uh, need also to be of very high quality. That's also what Anne mentioned uh, in, the, in the magnet design. And that's where, where we would come in then uh, to ensure this magnet quality with our uh, unique measurement systems. Um, so you also have uh, like plastic bonded magnets that allow to make sh any shape, any magnetization pattern. There are um, uh, very advanced uh, magnetization um, constructions with magnets like Halbach arrays that are again then used also in uh, new types of electric motors like actual flux motors that are going to play uh, an important role in the electrification of the cars because it's a new motor type and so on. So there's countless um, um, examples of where magnets uh, are really driven to, to their limits uh, of, of what can be done and need to be like reinvented, let's say, because effectively magnet manufacturers are also uh, continuously performing R&D uh, to make them temperature stable, uh, minimize the number of material and so on and so on. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it's fascinating. I think we've uh, we've sort of missed an opportunity to to explore, and obviously you've you've taken advantage of that because um, you know you've you've developed a, an inc uh, created an entire company around uh, magnetic sensing. So getting back to Ender's application and 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 um, any any sort of AMR um, turn turn sensor. If if we are trying to specify a magnet for something like that, which I would sort of consider as seems to be a simple application, um, what are the key sort of criteria or requirements I'm going to be looking for from my magnet? What what's what's supposed to be on my data sheet? Yeah, so that's that's a very good question because um, from our experience, many of our customers that uh, are making uh, magnetic systems, speed sensor systems, motors, uh, actuators, whatever. Um, they know that um, if you do a, if you start out by designing uh, a, a magnet, magnetic system, including a permanent magnet, in, in the simulation, for example, uh, the magnet is typically um, perfect. Like it has a certain shape, an internal magnetization that is homogeneous throughout the whole volume, that is in the correct orientation, and so on. And that gives a certain magnetic field around the magnet that is also perfect and predictable 
from this theoretical uh, magnet that you're starting from. But the reality is different. However, since magnets need to be produced from real life material, there can be inhomogeneities in this material. The shape can be a bit different than, than, than uh, the nominal value, uh, the, the sizes, and also the orientation of the, the magnetization can uh, deviate from uh, from the nominal uh, uh, orientation. For example, in the case where uh, typical application like in uh, and thus application multi-turn uh, encoder or rotary encoders in general, oftentimes a cylindrical magnet is used that is magnetized through the diametrical um, uh, orientation. Um, so if that is perfectly aligned, if the magnetization is perfectly aligned with that um, that that direction, then your field will be nicely symmetric all around and so on. And also it has the correct strength, of course. But what happens a lot of times is that the crystallographic structure of the magnet material is not aligned with the geometry of the magnet. And that's what we then call an angle, a magnetization angle error or deviation. And that completely skews the whole magnetic field distribution around the magnet and causes the magnetic field to be different from what you expect in the zone where you are using, for example, these analog devices sensors. And that's, uh, as, as uh, and also mentioned, uh, for his sensor, it is important that the magnetic field uh, at this GMR sensor is in a window of tolerance uh, between 16 and 32 millitesla. So this depends a lot on uh, how uh, homogeneous your magnet is magnetized, because the field around the magnet is not homogeneous, never. Uh, if you are close to the magnets, the field will be stronger. If you go further away, it will be weaker. And this has a very strong distance dependency. And also, if you shift sideways, you end up in different fields. And if you add on top of that that the magnet might have an angle deviation of its magnetization, then you might have a, a pretty different magnetic field uh, than, than you uh, actually anticipate from your simulation. And not to mention any inhomogeneities in the magnet. Suppose there's a small uh, inclusion in your magnet material that will disturb also the whole magnetic fields distribution. And that's exactly what we with MagCam can uh, visualize in a fast and very accurate way. Um, I'll show you some, some slides uh, later to show what yeah. we exactly mean by that. So looking at, the, um, uh, at uh, what I've seen at Embedded World and also uh, going across the, the website, obviously you, you've got lots of products and, and software that all help, but it all comes down to one sort of uh, core element of, of, of the system, which is the, the MagCam Minicube, which is your, your magnetic sensor. So what can these sensors do? So how big are they and, and how do they work? Okay, that's uh, um, it's my pleasure to, to explain this to you. Maybe if you could pull up um, my slides, I, I can have some illustration with that. Okay, great, thank you so much. So this uh, illustrates the magnetic field camera. Uh, the um, red cube that you can see there, um, yes, that's the actual magnetic field camera. Uh, and you see underneath that uh, there's a magnet depicted um, with, in which the north and south poles are indicated. This is a typical cylindrical magnet where the magnetization is uh, across the diametrical orientation, so from left to right or from right to left in this case. Uh, field is emanating from the left pole, which is the north pole, and goes all the way, way around the magnet in three dimensions and closes again at the south pole. Um, now, in the application of, of ENDA, for example, you would position uh, the GMR sensor somewhere in the middle of the magnet. Um, so what we can do with uh, our Minicube sensor, the Minicube is actually, uh, you've mentioned hall sensors in the beginning of the show. So our Minicube is actually a matrix of 16,000 plus hall sensors onto one single chip, which measures only half an inch by half an inch. So uh, these sensors are placed very close together, thanks to uh, it being integrated on a, a single semiconductor chip. And in, uh, in, in a best, very fast time, like one second, it takes a snapshot of the whole magnetic field distribution because it measures all of these 16,000 volt sensors. And it then creates an image like you can see on the right side. Actually, the right side is a collection of images because the magnetic field uh, of a magnet or any magnetic field is a vector, a three-dimensional vector field. And it can be decomposed into components. So um, actually, I think my picture is a bit in front of the, um, the axis uh, coordinate system there. 
but you have the x axis running to the yeah thank you very much that's that's clear like this so you see the coordinate system x is uh, going uh, to the right uh, y to the into the screen let's say and z upwards um, so you can decompose at every point of the magnet or on the magnet or in, in the volume of the magnet uh, you can specify the magnetic field at that point as a vector with a bx by bz component um, and these Distributions of these individual components are depicted on the top row of this screenshot, which is uh, taken from our software, which is used for, for this thorough analysis also of these field distributions. So you see the BX, BY, BZ um, uh, magnetic field distributions. Um, and then on the, the bottom row, you can see a combinations of these distributions, namely B, the first one is the combination of all of three, so it's the full field strength. BXY is only the XY field. Uh, only BX and BY taken together. And that's important, for example, for the application um, of this uh, encoder, rotary encoder magnets, because only the, the in-plane field, let's say the XY component, plays a role there. And then a very important uh, derived quantity for this application is the lower left, uh, lower right one, the orientation. That is actually the direction in which the field is pointing in the XY plane. And that's very important for this um, uh, multi-turn encoder um, uh, sensor application because that determines how uh, the field is uh, trying to remagnetize. Uh, in this case, these nano wires, for example, or in other cases, um, if, if a BX and a BY sensor are employed to to measure the orientation of a magnet in, in other typical rotary encoder applications, uh, that's that can be directly um, calculated from. Uh, from our measurements. So you, you directly get an image of the orientation of the field that can be used for, for example, a pass-fail analysis. I just wanted to jump in there on this on this image that we see on the right-hand side from the software as well. Is, is these images from a, a single, let's say, a pass of the sensor, or is, is this three um, three measurements of, of the magnet uh, in, in the different directions in order to... No, no it's, it's one single measurement, and you get in one uh, snap, you have all, all this information. So it's very fast measurement. And that's also um, the reason that our system is suitable for, for example, production lines. Uh, we have this sensor running in uh, fully automated production lines where sensor uh, producers are really measuring every single magnet and they measure millions of them, do an, an instantaneous pass-fail quality check and then uh, sort the magnets so the end customer then uh, can be sure that all of their magnets are measured and qualified. Yeah, well, that's really impressive. <laughs> Thanks. So, <laughs> so um, what what I've understood uh, as well that um, let's say you, you the the, um, the your customers are sort of like you say that they're, they're using the 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 the, the MagCam in their goods inwards often to to sort and check um, all the all the product that's coming in. Uh, to make sure it's the, the magnetic field is correct. Um, obviously, it's, that's a tiny little sensor um, that we've seen there on the, on the screen in that, that picture. Um, what goes around the sensor so that it can be used accurately to, to measure large magnets or motor rotors yep. and things like that? Um, if you pull up the slides again, I can uh, show how we do different types of magnets. So if you go to the next slide, um, yes, so this is our solution for small magnets. Um, where we integrate the mini cube into what we call the mini table, uh, which is a uh, positioning frame where magnets can be manually positioned or robots can position them in there. And this is for magnets like typically the rotary encoder magnets that require uh, that can be um, covered so that it's smaller than than the image size of the, of the camera. So you don't need um, moving uh, mechanics or so uh, other than just positioning the magnets. Uh, and then you, you get uh, immediately a magnetic field in, image. Um, so actually, in the, in the following slides, I, I was um, going a bit deeper in the analysis part, but I, you can, if you would go further, just, uh, just, or just I can maybe... We, just before yes. we move forward on that, yeah. a question on, on this particular slide. So um, we, we see that sort of um, that that thing around the, the, the MagCam sensor. What material is, is that made from? Because it, it looks like there's some metal parts on it, which I would assume sort of modify or change the, the magnetic field? A very good point. So um, they don't modify the field because they're uh, of non-magnetic materials. Um, and that's, of course, always an, um, 
uh, an important thing to consider. Um, so if you would use, for example, steel, uh, it would obviously um, modify the field, but it would also attract the magnets. The magnets would just snap to the steel and so on. And so that, for that, it's very important to use non-magnetic materials. We typically use a lot of aluminum. And the fact that it's black is because it's anodized. It's, it's a very nice right. property of aluminum. You can anodize it in, in also any other color. Um, you can do laser marking in it uh, for, for a nice uh, marking. Uh, so that, that's that's uh, what we use. And also for the, the screws, we use non-magnetic materials. Yeah. OK. Super. So and just to maybe if you, uh, I'll, I'll just go forward to the answer of your question about uh, other types of magnets. and. Then I might come back to this analysis of this uh, other magnet. So, um, of course, when we started 13 years ago, we only had the, the sensor. We started with the sensor for small magnets. But then, of course, um, questions and, and requests came for larger magnets. That's when we started building a scanner around our sensor um, for different applications. Um, so this is our, we have actually uh, a combi scanner that can do all types of, of magnets and magnet assemblies. We also have dedicated rotor scanners. Uh, but with a combi scanner, you can essentially do everything. So top left is a large flat magnet. Uh, it essentially moves the camera uh, upside down to very close to the magnet surface. It does a uh, step and image uh, process and stitches together these images to form a larger image that can then be analyzed. And due to the fact that uh, the, the measurement of a single frame goes so fast, uh, multiple frames also go fast because it just snap, move, snap, move, snap, and so on. Um, so then if, if you have a rotating magnet, so a typical um, radial flux rotor, like the bottom right uh, level uh, picture, you can measure by just rotating the, the camera in the scanner over 90 degrees, like you see in the lower left image. And then you can measure a, a rotor, permanent magnet rotor that is uh, used uh, extensively in electric motors, obviously. Uh, so there you can, you can measure small from very tiny motors or rotors to, to big ones that are used in electric vehicles, uh, even electric trucks and buses and so on. Uh, and what I mentioned, this actual flux motor is the one on the top right. This is also rotating rotor, but where the magnets are oriented in the axial direction. So there, that we can also measure by do, using a combination of this rotary Axis that is mounted and putting the magnets upside down. So this is these are typically the the types of, of magnets that we um, uh, measure, and uh, the, the most uh, applications have either flat faced magnets or uh, cylindrical shaped magnets. We have also done some um, uh, more exotic things like a contour magnet, where, which was neither flat nor uh, cylindrical, uh, but because of our uh, four axis mechanics, we could also do, do those kind yeah. of measurements. That's really, really impressive. So, so we're, we're rapidly avoiding running out of time. I've, I've got one more question before uh, we bring Ender back in. Um, I guess, I mean, obviously this is an amazing piece of, of, of technology for, for measuring things, but I, I, I guess it's um, price uh, from a price perspective, obviously something that um, requires a certain amount of investment. If, if you were developing something new and, and weren't ready to buy a, a complete MacCam sensing solution, is, is it possible to, to rent something like this for, for short term to maybe explore on, on, a, on a single project basis? Sure, sure. We have solutions for, for everybody's budget. So obviously, we are selling our systems uh, to customers that want to use it in-house and are more like uh, extensive users that use it on a daily basis. Uh, or weekly basis. Um, uh, we also do um, measurement services. That's also a very interesting uh, offer that we, we make. So you can just send your magnets to us. We measure them in our lab, since obviously we have all these systems in-house uh, and we know them inside out. So um, we measure your magnets. We do analysis because we, of course, know how to get most out of our software uh, analysis. Um, and you get a, a report. And so we can really advise you on what could be wrong with your magnet, always with us trying to understand your application, because it's very important that the, each application has different requirements for a magnetic field and a magnet. So this um, multi-turn encoder might put certain requirements on homogeneity and strength of the magnetic field. Another uh, application might uh, have, for example, for electric motors, the, 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 you have different poles. They should all have an equal size in terms of degrees. 
that that can be analyzed and so on. So um, um, if I can just very quickly show in, in these slides, uh, a, a, if you go like this, this is a good and a bad magnet of these cylinder magnets. You, you might not see it immediately, but if you look in detail, so on the top left, you see the, ac the actual flux, so the north-south pole of this magnet. Yeah. The good magnet, it uh, is, has a, like a straighter line in the middle, and the bad magnet is a little bit bent. Uh, if you then look at the, the right, top right picture, which is the orientation of the field, you see that on the right side, this is skewed. So yeah. this yeah. field uh, might be out of spec for an application like a rotary encoder magnet. So exactly. that's yeah. that's something that we, it's, it's, it might be very subtle, and because like Enda mentioned, uh, these tolerances are, are very uh, yeah, uh, narrow and, and uh, we can, it's not evident to measure it, but with our technology it's possible. That's fascinating, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. I, I love that, that picture, it's sort of, um, I, I can't imagine how else you would sort of discover that type of uh, issue with, a, with, with a, something that was supposed to have a, a yeah. uniform magnetic uh, then, field. So. Sure, and it can save a lot of headache for developers of magnetic systems because obviously magnetic fields, you don't see it, you buy magnets, but then like half of them don't work. <laughs> but if you just put it on a MacM, you see the yeah. So it's, it's hours and days and weeks of work saved. Super. Let's bring Ender back into the group here. Hi, Ender. Good to see you still there. Hi. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> okay. Very interesting, Colin. That was a great presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so we've, um, um, we've got some uh, uh, some questions from the audience. Firstly, uh, we'll say hello to C3M Solutions. Uh, they say hello from the USA, and they've actually got a, a question um, for you, Cohen. Um, here it says, "Oh, hang on a second. I've <laughs> I'm having trouble today with my with my mouse. Um, where are the biggest opportunities for MagCam? Is it automotive industry, medical devices? Um, what what where do you see the most interest um, for for you know ne needing to measure and, and uh, ensure the quality of of magnets? Yeah, good question. Um, there are we are playing in different markets. We are aiming at all actually all the high end magnet applications. Uh, of course, the permanent magnet industry as a whole is is growing. Um, and the applications range from uh, medical devices, indeed, consumer electronics, like you have microphones, actuators in phones, um, uh, sensors everywhere. Um, electric cars, of course, is a big one. The electric motors, um, if they are powered by permanent magnets, rotors, then uh, they, uh, it's a huge volume of, of magnets that's going uh, around in the world, so that's a big opportunity. But also in cars in general, it's not only the electric motor, but also all the sensor systems, like Enda mentioned, there's a, a load of sensors sensors uh, in cars, also smaller electric motors for seat adjustments, uh, uh, mirrors, and so on. Um, so that that's uh, all automotive industry, obviously. Uh, in the medical, there's also a lot of uh, pumps, systems, um, uh, heart pumps, for example, uh, hearing aids, you know, all these, these things are using permanent magnets. Uh, those, they're, they're typically smaller, but should be super accurate. Of course, it's very important if they go in the body that they're of uh, um, perfect quality, so their quality control is very important. Uh, yeah. Also, in the consumer electronics, uh, phones use, use, use a lot of magnets. Um, in, in watch making, there's a, a lot of magnets being uh, used. And, and of course, people are also looking at new magnet materials because obviously um, most rare earth magnet uh, materials are uh, sourced in China, but right. it raises some concerns. Well, of course, if, if, if the electric vehicle market is going to increase, where uh, how do you make sure that in, in all parts of the world you have enough resources of magnets? So people are also researching alternative magnet materials um, and also those need to be of good quality. Obviously. Yeah. Super. So there we go. That's uh, an answer for C3M. Um, for Ender, I've got a, a question here. We were talking earlier um, about the, the AMR GMR multi turn sensor. And one of the things you said uh, where I wanted to dig a bit deeper was the fact that there is a, a risk that magnetic fields in the area um, could mm -hmm. Im impact the, uh, the, the sensing ability. I mean, bearing in mind we're talking about things that have strong magnetic fields like motors or there might be a, a transformer or something, um, an electro electrical transformer uh, in close yep. proximity. What sort of um, approaches are there to magnetic shielding? What, what options mm -hmm. are, are possible? 
Yeah, with the, with the multi-turn chip, as I mentioned, there's a magnetic window you have to operate within. So um, in a harsh environment with, with straight fields, we would highly recommend a shielding. So um, that can be done either um, within the, the actual uh, module itself, or we can do it as a, uh, down at the uh, at the magnet as well. We have a um, a reference magnet design which incorporates its own shield uh, within the magnet construction. So that's a sort of a you know that's for for for, for a customer starting off. That's quite a good a good solution because they can um, they can get it to up uh, up and running and operating quite quickly uh, with that type of ma with that type of shield. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's 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 the uh, that's that's how it's how it's done. I mean. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not 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 a showstopper because customers see still see the value of the 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 multi turn absolute uh, capability, and uh, that they can eliminate uh, gearing, they can eliminate linear transducers or backup batteries. So, adding a low cost uh, metal metal shield isn't 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 uh, isn't that uh, it, you know is not putting at all. In fact, it's quite a low yeah. cost in, in the grand scheme of things. I, I guess it's a, a, a challenge as to sort of how big and heavy uh, that shield is is, is going to be. I was, um, funnily enough, mm -hmm. I, I was looking at the um, the uh, electromagnetic capability um, compatibility standards, and uh, mag magnetic fields is is one of those. And, and one of the things mm -hmm. I read, and I don't know, maybe you 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 both are better placed than me to uh, respond to this this uh, piece of data I found. But they said that uh, a three millimeter thick steel um could would o would only offer 20 db reduction in a in a 50 hertz magnetic field um and to do the same with aluminium would require a 25 millimeter thick piece of uh, aluminium so um it, you know I, I guess there's that sort of weight and and uh, yeah, no, that thing to be thinking that, about that, as well. That's certainly overkill. I mean, we're 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 working with uh, automotive customers uh, in the harshest of environments. Um, you know, the, the standards there are about four four milli tesla um, straight field, and you know, we can get ready. We can we can work with a very very thin thin shield to overcome to overcome. It, it, it's 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 a combination of the shield with the uh, the magnet design. Um, but no, we're, we're nowhere near three millimeters. In fact, we're much we're probably more than one millimeter or less uh, type right. type uh, thickness. Okay, super. I'll go back to our um, uh, viewers today. So Prat H um, asked also, uh, funnily enough, as I was asking Cohen about whether that um, that picture that we saw the, the the results from the MagCam sensor measurement of this single uh, circular magnet was that just from one measurement. Um, he um, he or she, I think it's a, a gentleman, uh, had also asked at exactly the same time, was it only one measurement? And of course, we answer that straight away. So thank you again for participating today and, and your question. And we also have Brian. Hi, Brian. Good to see you back on again. Um, he has a question for Cohen. And he's asking, how does MagCam handle noise reduction in challenging measurement environments? So that's, that sort of brings us a little bit back to what we were just talking about there that, um, that Ender spoke on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so MACCAM uh, systems are typically um, placed not in the end application environment, as are the, the sensors that Enda is, uh, is selling. Uh, we are in on the R&D uh, quality control, production quality control side of things. So typically in rather controlled environments uh, at the producer or the manufacturer of a magnetic system. Um, and there, typically we, we don't uh, have harsh environments. Um, so uh, effectively, it's, it's uh, also um, it, it's typically laboratory environments, uh, R and D labs, um, production halls, uh, but also in production halls, uh, we typically operate in in, uh, in not too harsh conditions. Um, so actually, that that is not really um, an, an issue for for our applications. Um, that being said, um, we, we have ways to, to uh, reduce noise in our measurements. Uh, it's actually a very interesting um, feature of our software that um, if you measure far away from a magnet, then you measure a smaller field. Uh, like um, So the field is very dependent on distance to a magnet. Uh, like uh, Anna also mentioned, you have to have a window uh, between 16 and 32 millitesla, but you would typically have that at a certain distance of a magnet with a certain magnetization. Um, we can uh, take advantage of a measurement close to the magnet and projecting that to the further uh, position, whereby we retain the signal-to-noise ratio of the close measurement. So this is actually tricking a bit 
physics. I mean, it's, it's using the laws of physics to, to get um, more accurate values than we can actually intrinsically measure with the whole system. But uh, that's, that's one of the applications. But um, in harsh environments, that's not really an issue for us. Super. OK, so Brian, I hope that uh, helped to answer your question. Um, now, one of the other th um, things that popped into my mind is obviously we've got these we've got these lovely semiconductor sensors. Uh, we've got a a, a very high quality uh, magnetic field um, sensor measurement. Um, but what happens if I'm you know if I'm just searching around in my uh, laboratory as as many of our electoral readers are, and I find the magnet, um, is there anything I can do? Any sort of trick I can use or, or simple setup I can use just to get a a feeling for for magnetic field? Is, is a um, and anything that you uh, put two magnets near each other or something, or or maybe build a little circuit with a single hole sensor? Um, yeah, uh, I, I would say you can build a circuit of a single hole sensor. Of course, the simplest thing is to go close to a piece of steel and see how much it attracts. That gives you a feeling of how strong this magnet is. Um, if you really want to see the uh, magnetization pattern, um, you could try to use uh, this small compass, a small compass, for example, um, or you have this kind of green foil that is often sold also in online magnet stores that shows you a uh, magnetization pattern. It only shows you in or out of plane, but it gives you a feeling yeah. for the magnetization. Um, and of course, you can you can build something with a single hole sensor. Um, and then, yeah, then you can, you can read the field in one uh, position. If you would move around the sensor, you would see the field in different positions. Of course, then uh, if you really want to have it accurately, you have to know the distance to the magnet, how deep is this sensor embedded in its uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but these are indeed ways that, that you could do some low costing. But as soon as you go to really um, advanced applications and it has to be very accurate and you need to, to know what the magnets uh, in, in a more accurate way, then you need to go to the more advanced solutions. Uh, maybe Ender can can uh, add to uh, this. I I think you've covered it well there, Cohen. To be honest, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sounds yeah. good. So um, Ender, one last question for you. Hmm? Um, I I saw the demo at um, Sensor and, and Test, and um, as yep. you, as you mentioned earlier, that it's definitely worth visiting the website um, analog.com/magnetics. Mm -hmm. There's there's a, a really good article about about the sensor on there, but um, yep. our viewers will immediately see that there's no data sheet at the minute. So mm -hmm. what's the plan in terms of sort of getting the product out on, on a broader basis? Uh, when, when will sort of a data sheet be available? And at what point would we be able to order um, yep. a, a, uh, an evaluation or demo kit uh, through the, the, the typical channels? Sure. Yeah, for the moment, what we're doing is we're we're under NDA with customers. We're providing preliminary data sheets, evaluation board samples, and and so on. So we're we're yeah we're driving on, um, uh, you know, fully engaging customers at this time. the The plan for release is uh, would be Q one of of next year. Um, yeah. So that's 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 when we're planning the uh, the release of the product to the market. But we've done a, a lot of extensive. Uh, Testing reliability, intrinsic reliability, and so on. So the uh, there's very high confidence that the uh, that you know that everything will go as planned. And get this part into the market. Yeah, Sounds so good. so it's very, very exciting. We've only got a, a few a few seconds left, basically, but uh, I wouldn't mind getting one one last question off my chest. Um, sure. Do do magnets left alone and unused lose their magnetism with time? Cool. I'll put that one over to you. <laughs> um, yes, uh, if they are left unused but in stable conditions, typically they keep their uh, properties and their magnetization. If they are exposed to higher temperatures, they might lose their properties. That's an, uh, an issue for windmills, cars, where they go to temperature cycles. There are ways to stabilize uh, magnets to uh, withstand these temperature variations. That's very expensive additions or additives to the magnets um, uh, but indeed if, if you leave it in good conditions it uh, keeps its magnetism i suppose just to add maybe as well right the material of the magnet is very dependent on the stability of the magnet over lifetime as well go on right, right. depending on the material sure. yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. yeah we wouldn't go yeah there's different different materials and and, and still ongoing research in that topic
Fantastic. Well, thank you both ever so much uh, for sharing all your uh, information with us today. Uh, it's been absolutely brilliant to have you on the show. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. looking at uh, yeah, the, um, something that I haven't had so much experience with, so it's, it's really been a good chance to learn. So thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks, Stuart, for having us. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Stuart. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Well, that's all we have time for in this episode. So what did we learn? There's definitely a lot more to magnets than meets the eye. And today with electric vehicles pushing out fossil, uh, fossil fuel burning engines, engineers are keen to explore even more deeply how magnetism impacts the efficiency and the performance of the motors they deploy. Clever semiconductor sensors are also capable of measuring magnetic fields using a changing magnetic field to determine the rotation of objects like motors and shafts. However, unless you're already using such technology, you may find it difficult to know how to even start specifying and comparing available magnets. So hopefully you've drawn something out of uh, the information our guests have shared with us today. Thankfully, technologies do exist and they provide a reliable means of measurement to ensure that the magnets you choose best suit the application you're building. Thanks to today's experts, Ender Nickel from Analog Devices and Cohen Fefeka from MagCam. You've delivered us with some outstanding engineering insights. So that wraps it up for today. If you'd like more of the same, we're broadcasting two episodes of Engineering Insights every month in 2023. And to keep you abreast of industry trends this year, take a look at News Bytes, our monthly 15 minute news roundup. Please like, subscribe to Elector TV Industry on YouTube and share our videos on whatever platforms you use. Additionally, you can now drop by the website at electormagazine.com slash EEI to see the topics for future shows and sign up for regular updates and reminders. Finally, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet, or reach out to me, Stuart Cording, on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining, stay in touch, and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions.